if you asked us a few years ago, do you think you need to move to the UK to seek asylum and to be a refugee? I said, what? They don't understand how lucky they are that such a huge majority of countries speak English. Yeah. You should be united as human, not thinking about the borders. Oh, you can go to McDonald's and wash the dishes because you can't do anything with the language barrier. Human rights in this country. We all know this. Welcome to the Media Storm Studio. We're so thrilled to be joined today by two special guests. Our first guest is a journalist and TV anchor based in London. He has written for The Guardian, Newsweek, Middle East Eye and The African Arguments. He's the editor-in-chief at Egypt Watch and host of the podcast Untold Stories. He is a refugee, a former dentist and an advocate for refugees and asylum seekers' rights. Welcome to the studio, Osama Gawish. Thank you for having me. Our second guest is a journalist and newsreader who worked in Afghanistan for more than a decade. Following the Taliban's rise to power in August 2021, she fled to the UK where she has volunteered and worked with the Refugee Council, BBC Afghan and the International Rescue Committee and more. She's also a former Refugee Week ambassador at IMIX, the charity which offers training, coaching and mentoring to those with both lived and learnt experience of migration. Welcome to the studio, Zara Shahir. Thank you for having me. Happy World Refugee Day to you both. And thank you so much for being here. Thank Our, you. The first topic we want to discuss is language. Now, a word that so often follows refugee or migrant in our media is the word crisis. Mm -hmm. A humanitarian crisis is typically defined as an event that critically threatens the health, safety, security or well-being of a community. We find it telling that in most cases when our media describes the refugee crisis, the crisis they seem to be referring to is not the hundreds of millions of people who have been displaced from their homes, but the tens of thousands trying to come to ours. Is the term crisis accurate when we talk about the UK's refugee crisis or, or what do you think crisis should refer to in this context? Please. You want to start with Zara? Uh, yeah, I think it is definitely something I agree with this word. This term is definitely a good term that we can use for refugee crisis because it highlights the urgency. It highlights the need that refugees need help they need support, uh, like the same as we have economic crisis. It's the same. There's uh, different angles with this crisis. It's not only we can focus in the host country with refugees, uh, what they need, why they uh, forced to flee from their countries. Uh, as I mentioned about uh, economic crisis, when there's some problem, all governments think how to find a solution through diplomatic relations with other countries, through uh, finding the problems with climate change and other things. It's the same with refugee crisis. They need to think why the refugees uh, forced to flee, why, uh, what was in their country. It all relates to war and conflict. They must stop the war and conflict in the countries that the people are uh, had to flee and come for safety. So it's about, so the term crisis is accurate when we're describing the refugees who are forced to flee their home. But unfortunately, I guess in our media, the they often use the word crisis about the amount of refugees coming yeah. to the UK. Um, yes. Is that the crisis? Yeah, I, I won't jump in. Um, to be honest, I, I disagree with, with, with Zahra because describing people as crisis is not fair. We can talk about economic crisis, we can talk about border crisis, we can talk about inflation crisis, but we can label people as crisis. I think this is a quiet, um, I, 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 I describe this as a racist label because people are not crisis. People force it to flee. People force it to, to, to have this horrible journey, to have this death journey across borders or, or in dinghies in, in, in the Channel and in, in the Mediterranean. So the, the media here in this country and in Western media, to be honest, they use this crisis to label refugee as they are a threat to these countries. Uh, we, we can't manage these people. Uh, these people, we, we need to send them to Rwanda. We we need to send them again to, to their uh, country of origin. So I think we need to reconsider 
describing people as crisis because crisis, as Zara said, we can talk about economic, we can talk about emergency case. It is emergency case, but without labeling people as crisis. It seems to me that the crisis is that uh, the UK continues to make stopping migrants its priority rather than protecting and, and processing vulnerable people. So it's a it's a redefinition. You say it's a redefinition that's needed and you say it's a word that should not be attached to people. Yeah. Well, I think actually while we're speaking about language, I think we should move one step further and actually talk about some of the terms that are used so frequently in the media, but often really like never thought about with any kind of detail. As mentioned in the introduction, we celebrate World Refugee Day today, and it's the anniversary of the 1951 Geneva Convention, which laid out an international definition of for refugees. This definition is someone who is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. But this is not the definition used by media outlets who reserve the term refugees for people whose request for asylum has been approved by a host country. Instead, we use terms like migrant, uh, asylum seeker, illegal immigrant. What is the problem with this differentiation in language between the legal and the literal meaning of refugee? Uh, again, I can say uh, some terms and words can make us confused. It brings confusion to the audience, to the other people when they hear like different uh, words like migrants, illegal migration. I'm against illegal migration. There is no illegal migration because as we mentioned, uh, we said that people forced to flee. They, they, are, they don't choose to come for a better life. Uh, some people think in first world countries, other uh, refugees who are coming from third world countries or from war and conflict, they are coming for better life. Basically, this is not for better uh, life. They come for safety. Some, some people choose to come through safe routes. Some people choose to uh, come through uh, unsafe routes. There's not, there's not safe routes for them to come. Uh, so these words, when they, they make confusion, and um, it's in the media job. They should use the proper terms uh, to make it clear for the audience and for the people to understand. And they can imagine themselves as a refugee. Refugees like protection, they need protection. So we, uh, we, as a government, we need to protect them. Host countries need to protect them. If we call it like illegal migration, it is something, it's not fair for, for a person who forced to flee and lost everything, and we call them illegal migration. It is, it is in my idea, it's not something fair with refugees. Uh, refugee itself, uh, it's a word, it, it, it's not something that we choose. Like when we speak about some uh, terms like peace and conflict, you see, like you feel peace has a nice sound to you and conflict, it doesn't sound good for you. You know what's the problem there. It's the same if I have my citizenship in my country, like I'm the citizen of the country. So it's so peaceful for me. I feel so relaxed and I feel so independent. When a refugee, I feel down myself. Oh, there is something, I don't have some rights. Like you see in election, we don't have the right to go for vote. There's the difference between being a citizen and a refugee. Mm. And when we call it illegal migration or asylum seeker, it's, it's uh, something you feel more down yourself and it is very painful for the person who doesn't have any right to, to study, to work, uh, it's through the law, we know. But it has like some steps. We should think like refugee is a refugee, but with different levels. Mm. I, I totally agree with, with Zahra. And we both had prominent job in our country of origin. She was um, a prominent speaker and I was a prominent dentist. I was a manager of a hospital. So if you asked us a few years ago, do you think you need to move to the UK to seek asylum and to be a refugee? I said, what? 
No, I'm happy with my country. I'm happy with my job. I'm happy with everything here. So I don't need to this. So we force it to leave. We force it because we didn't look or think about a better life. As Zara said, we're just looking for safety. She, she had a um, living in a war zone when Taliban took power and, and we had a military coup and they then start targeted every activist in the country. So we forced it to leave. The only place we got is here. And we tried and struggled to, to, to find a new life, a new job. And we pay a tax buyer. And we, we are, as, as any British citizen in, in, in this country, we're not overloading this country. No, we're adding value to this society. So this should be the, 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 the way the media treat with us. We, we, we are not um, overloaded in this country, no. We have prominent history, we have prominent job, so we have prominent country, and we wouldn't have to leave our, 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 our country. This is the first thing. The other thing is quite interesting when um, the Western countries experienced a war in 2022, when Russia invaded Ukraine. I didn't remember any ministry media or any outlet, even with the tabloid or the other, labeled the Ukrainian as illegal immigrant, mm -hmm. as asylum seeker. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. It's Ukrainian refugee and this our commitment in the country and there is safe routes for Ukrainian. So there is safe road and we are respecting the white refugee. I think this is another another hypocrisy in, in the ministry media. Why you differentiate between people? This for Middle Eastern, so illegal immigrants, they are overload. We will send them to Rwanda. But this is Ukraine. Oh, they are my, my, our brothers. The same ethnicity. They are refugee from Ukraine. Oh, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. And it is, as you mentioned in your first answer, do you think that we're, we as a society are uh, almost scared to call it racism? Do you think we, we call out the fact that it is racism enough? I think it is racism. And it's intentionally doing this with, with people. The media, they, they, they are willing to do this with others. They, they are talking about the covering or, of media of refugee stories like victims or criminals. The, 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 there is no midpoint between both. You are a victim and we, we sympathize with you. Oh, my God. And that's it. And the other thing, you are a criminal. You are illegal. You come from the boat. We will send you to Rwanda. So th there is a midpoint between two. Yeah. He is a human being. She's a human being. Just treat with him like this. Yes. And this brings us, I think, very neatly onto what we want to talk about next, which is this kind of disproportionate dis distribution of positive refugee stories in our media and negative refugee stories in our media. Now, we did some searching and we did find some positive, but vastly more negative stories about refugees in general. Most of the stories were about the poor conditions that refugees live in, the record number of displaced people, or the number of so-called channel migrants. What is the impact of this coverage, this consistent negative coverage about refugees? I think uh, the negative coverage, uh, again, it uh, make confusion. Uh, I think media outlets should, uh, outlet should uh, work as a um, bridge. And uh, confidentiality uh, is something that they should think about it. But sometimes uh, media, uh, they just only think about their time, how to cover the gap. They never think about uh, someone's personal life and how it affects on their life. Uh, there's a lot of negative news about refugees and show the uh, refugees how dangerous they are in the host country. Like nowadays in Germany, there's all news about Afghan refugees. One Afghan refugee killed a police officer. And a lot of Afghan refugees uh, deported back in Afghanistan in this situation. Because what happened, they uh, never thought about the other angles of the accident or how it happened. Was there any other angle and problem with the police officer? Is there any other story behind why that man? I'm not going to support that Afghan man. He's a criminal. But uh, when a refugee is coming in a country and we only focus on negative points, it can make it worse. And uh, it uh, changes the policies. The governments change their policies against refugees and they become stricter to, to make a strict law against refugees. 
yeah. in the UK, there's a lot of cover negative coverage about refugees. Like uh, I had done a lot of advocacy for refugee rights in the UK. The monster come, you see, and children and accompany their hair, but they never think about them. They never think even a child under 18 is here alone uh, himself. He needs his family. They never think about the family reunion. They only think how to cover negative about refugees. Why a mother sent his child alone? He was at risk. A mother never wants to send his child away from herself. But when she has to, she forced to save her children, she needs to do that. They never think about positive. Why a mother do that? But they only think she's a careless mom. Mm. So she, she sent her uh, son for a better life, as I mentioned before. They never do that. They want their children to have a safe life, to do edu uh, their education and to rebuild their life. No one wants to take uh, their own child to put the, in the fire, to just see the child is burning. But this coverage, a lot uh, have the negative impact uh, among the folk and also making stricter uh, the policies of the governments. Mm. Yeah, I, I think this this cover, this negative coverage, is like a collective punishment for the whole refugee in this country. You know, mm. you are a refugee, so we will punish you by negative coverage. Mm. So it, it's it's um, I um, I recall two examples in the first wave of COVID in two thousand twenty. In the early days of 2020, we, we had a very sad news that three members of the frontline NHS doctors have died. And the surprise was that they were refugees from Sudan and Somalia. Yes. So this was a good example for everyone in the mainstream media. These are the refugee in this country. The other one is the brilliant Hassan Aqad, the Syrian refugee who won BAFTA, who um, crossed the border, who came from Syria and then he volunteered as a worker in the NHS in the first wave of, of COVID. This is what the refugee can do to this country. They are a part of this country. They want to be a part of this country. They want to feel belongings to this country because they, they can't look back. They can't go back. There is no Syria. There is no Egypt. There is no Afghanistan for many of us now because we can't go back. We can't return to our homeland. So if we have a chance, we will do, but we can't. So this is our new country and we are belonging to this society. We want to add values to this society. The other thing is I, I have done a story on Eritrean uh, refugees, specifically children that Zahra mentioned. In Eritrea, there is a horrible system called the life indefinite military service. They took children from 13 and 14 and put them in the military for life. So the mother, the father, Anyone who think about the future of his son try to move him to the Sahara Desert in Ethiopia and then move to Libya and then crossing the border and arrive at the Europe or, or the UK. And then he face a former Home Secretary like Sovela Praverman who said, why are you here? You need to send you to Rwanda. Are you kidding him? Rwanda will send him to Eritrea uh, once again. So we even don't respect the definition of refugee. We even don't consider the threat, the persecution in these countries. Yes, absolutely. There is a big gap when we read about refugees in our media and that gap is often their backstory and their, their personal story. And then <clears throat> that leads to such a severe lack of empathy um, for people reading the news. You've mentioned Rwanda a couple of times, and I just want to ask about that quickly. Um, when the government's Rwanda deportation scheme was announced, there was outrage about how callous and, and dangerous the whole idea to send refugees to another country and an unsafe, potentially unsafe country was. Um, I want to know that, first of all, were you surprised when the uh, government created the Rwanda deportation scheme. Did it did it surprise or shock you in any way? Both <laughs> surprise and shocked me because I came from this uh, continent. I came from Africa. I know well Kagame presidents. He's like Egyptian presidents. He's like Libyan late presidents Gaddafi, and he like every single one in the Middle East. 
they are authoritarian leaders. And we all know what authoritarian leaders do to its people, to their people. Persecution, uh, injustice, and every single topic the media here advocates against, and we need to respect the human rights. There is no human rights in this country. We all know this. And there is a plenty of reports, um, warns the government here not to send refugee again to Rwanda because there is a lot of um, a lot of reports consider Kagame as authoritarian and there is a human rights um, uh, issues in, in this country but the government here is proud to do this and this is something even against the British values you are teaching our children in this country's school of British values that we are with the human rights and with the freedom of expression, a freedom there is no human rights and freedom of expression. And there is a threat, a real threat about anyone who go to Rwanda again, forcibly uh, disappeared and persecuted. But the government, I, I don't know, I don't know why they choose a country like Rwanda or any African country. I respect all African countries, but we, we, we have a lot of things to reform in these countries regarding human rights. Mm, mm. Were you surprised to to hear about the scheme or did you think it's in line with how this government has acted towards refugees? Uh, I, I was like shocked, I can say. It was very shocking to me when uh, and I, uh, I remember that when I arrived in the UK, I was new in this country and they said they are going to send refugees mm. in Rwanda. And I was thinking... Okay, I was a journalist, I had a good job, everything, and if I go to, if they send me in Rwanda with my two children, is there any, like, kind of good facilities for my children to learn? Is, I, do, uh, I can find the opportunity to work in Rwanda? Is there any uh, rights as a refugee that I have in the UK? And the problem is, uh, as you mentioned, I don't know why they choose another third world country to, to send the refugees. Refugees come for safety. I think Rwanda is not that safe for refugees to go there and to rebuild their life. It is, the plan is wasting the people's life, uh, wasting Definitely. their time. Mm -hmm. They want to just play around to waste their time and show them how uh, your time is not valuable for us because you come as a refugee in this country, you don't have the rights uh, in this country and we don't value your time. We don't value your life. And everyone has a goal in their life. They want to do something. As a human, we need to be alive. We don't need to be starving. But they, they never think about this stuff. They just only think about policies. Mm. What to, uh, like some, some people, they think like I had done something different. Mm. They think about differences. <laughs> oh, let's make some different policy and maybe it will be supportive. Uh, but I, I, I'm really against uh, sending the refugees in Rwanda. It's only just wasting time of refugees. Absolutely. I think it's uh, it's interesting that you, you said there about they only think about the policies because we, when we were searching to find, you know, how many positive versus negative stories there were, um, it was very interesting because when we were searching the term refugee on individual news sites, we'd find a varied selection of stories. When we search migrant, almost all of the coverage was negative or about about party manifestos, so about policies. Um, this was particularly stark on the BBC, actually. We searched refugees, the stories were largely positive on the search page. With migrant, the stories were overwhelmingly negative. We've mentioned a few times about positive stories, and one story we did see this week was this. Former refugee becomes Northern Ireland's first black mayor. This is, of course, a really great story. It's a success story. However, often we see kind of two extremes with refugee stories. Either they're kind of, you know, faceless, nameless people crossing the channel or they're successful re refugees that beat the odds. You know, they're the first mayor, they're an Olympic gold medalist, they're a BAFTA winner. Um, what does this say about how we value refugees? I think the problem that in, in here in the media, we focus more on the, um, the dark side of the story the emotional side of the story, how he crossed the channel, how he arrived the country, um, how the home office put him in a limbo. And this happened with me, with the Guardian story they publish. 
about me in March 2019. Thanks for the Guardian. They, they published this story, but they, they focus more on, on, on the emotional side. I think we need in the mainstream media to focus not on the successful stories only or on the refugee as victims and so on. No, we need to focus on the the job, the, the, the history, the, the positive points of, of this man or woman or girl or whatever in his homeland or her homeland. Zara had a prominent career in, in her homeland and me too and plenty of refugees have work and job and um, impact in the society in homeland. Just raise this, highlight this, telling the people in the UK that we have a good man, we have a good girl, we have a good woman. They, 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 they were brilliant in their homeland and they will do the same in this country. Not, oh my God, he, he been through all this. Oh my God, I'm, I'm, this empathy and, you know. No, we need to, to, to deal with these people with proudly. Oh my God, he's a doctor, she's a speaker, he's an engineer, he's a teacher. This is what I think, in my opinion, the newsroom here in this country need to focus on. Mm. And one more thing about the Rwanda Pell, because uh, before we pass it, I think we move from dealing um, a mystery, the refugee in this country, to export our racism coverage to other countries. For example, I'm originally from Egypt. And you know, in Egypt, the national media are fully owned and controlled by the general intelligence where the president's son is working. And they started now a campaign against the Sudan, Sudanese refugee and refugee from Syria and even Palestinians. And they put some hashtags on Twitter and um, social media, just evacuate and deport all refugee from our country. And when people start to advocate for refugees and asylum seekers in Egypt, the national media owned and controlled by the general intelligence said, look to Britain. They are sending the refugee to Rwanda. This is a country of democracy. This is a country of human rights. This is the idol of you. So we need to do the same as, as UK. So congratulations to the government. Mm -hmm. You are exporting this racism and this mystery to refugee to authoritarian leaders in the Middle East. Wow. Yeah, that's a very incredible point. Thank you. Um, and I guess it leads me to ask, I wonder... How much do you think that the decisions to ramp up immigration control are made in response to media pressure or media negativity? How much do you think the media affects policy? A lot, as I mentioned uh, before. Like media, we, uh, sometimes we think that media is only doing his job. But it's not only the media's job that they just cover the news and just uh, fill up the gap. It has a lot of impact from people, from governments, the policies, everything. Whatever we say today, when people hear uh, these words, they keep in mind and they think about it. It's the same with policymakers. When they, they listen to the news, they see the impacts and they make their decision. Uh, why they don't change about uh, refugees as I agree with you, Osama, you said we had like good jobs, we come as a refugee. Sometimes refugees can be change makers in other countries, in the host country. Why they don't think like positive about it? They only think about like some, some uh, people think in the UK, uh, refugees are coming here, taking our jobs. <laughs> Yeah. It's only thing, even when I see anyone, or I speak with them, they think, oh, they come and they took our job and uh, they don't think about other uh, points that they, when they come, they take the jobs. Uh, they, they also do work hard. They bring changes in this country. They pay tax, everything. So they are also working as a human, as a citizen, uh, citizen of this country. Um, but... Uh, as I as I mentioned, like uh, about the problem what happened in Germany, it's the same in the UK. There was uh, news about uh, Afghan refugees and Syrian refugees in the UK, and uh, what the government did, they promised like uh, they will uh, bring a lot of Afghans, uh, especially vulnerable Afghans, like women rights activists, journalists, uh, women who work as a judge in Afghanistan. They're at risk. There's a lot of people at risk, but they stopped the process. Mm. 
because they thought there's a lot of Afghans. Millions of uh, pounds has been spent in hotels for Afghan refugees. So why we should spend all the money for those Afghan refugees? They can stay uh, in their country and they don't uh, have any problem there. But they don't know how a woman with her children is uh, escaping from one house to other house, from one uh, province to other province, just to save her life and her children's life. Uh, this is the media uh, uh, outlet that it can affect the policies and they, they, they just only think about uh, to change the policy and to do not think about humanity. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think you, there, there is a good statement I, I've learned the first week I, I arrived to the country. A refugee is not your enemy. Your enemy is the regime that make this refugee. Mm -hmm. or made this refugee. So the mainstream media here need to understand this. Refugee is not a problem in this country. Refugee didn't cause the price soar. Refugee didn't cause the inflation to increase. Refugee didn't make the NHS salary low. Refugee didn't um, force Britain to leave the, the, the European Union or call the Brexit. Uh, refugee are not the problem of any of this, the government here in this country and some political parties with their pathetic policies and their support and backing authoritarian leaders in the Middle East, they are the problem. They are making this refugee and they are making this problem to this society. Just please understand this. We are not the problem. Yes, yes, I agree. Because what happened in Afghanistan, for example, it was, I always say the controller of the game was in United States' hand. They played the very bad game with Afghanistan yeah. and they made people to flee. And what they did, they make a plan. They said, oh, we will save you. And they just brought the um, army charters and asked the people to come and we will save you. And it, it is the uh, politicians that they, they played the game with the country, and they are, the Taliban are like enemies for the UK government. Mm -hmm. And uh, also they put like something, they say, you uh, came in our country and you got all the experts from my country. If an expert woman live in Afghanistan, what should she do? There's no job for her. Mm -hmm. But still, they are enemies for each other. Taliban thinks that why they come and they saved a lot of women and they have democracy now in the UK or other uh, European countries and they raise their voice against their government. See, they are like yeah. uh, enemies with each other. Yeah. Refugees are not re uh, enemies and people who are coming as a refugee, they want to raise their voice. There's also some problem. Uh, people want to shut their mouth to mm. do not uh, do advocacy for other refugees, yeah. to do not raise their voice for their homeland, to do not raise their voice for their people. We are all human. I have the right to raise my voice for those poor girls who are still in Afghanistan. They don't have their fundamental right to go for education and work. But but most of, most of the time I see, like, even the government thinks that you're safe here. Just think about yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, for example, in Egypt, we, we have a military coup in 2013. We have more than 100 thousand political prisoners in jails. We have more than 300 news outlets even banned or shut down by, by the, the regime. A lot of human rights um, reports from Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, even the, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the United States, they published reports about how bad the human rights situation in Egypt. Okay, what the government here is doing with Egypt since 2013, they are supporting the, the uh, authoritarian leader, Sisi, with arms sales. They are welcoming him here in the country, in 10, town, uh, 10 Downing Streets, and they are turning a blind eye of all these human rights abuses. So when Egyptians flee the country and arrive to the UK, oh, they're asking, why we have Egyptian refugees in this country? Because of your, of your government policies. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thank you both so much. Um, so incredibly uh, interesting and and necessary for people to to hear these the, to hear your stories and I think um, it does lead us on to talk a little bit more about the fact that 
solutions-focused positive reporting does exist, largely in part to refugees who are journalists, who are working so hard to tell the true story. We have found an increase in solutions-focused positive reporting recently, likely because it is Refugee Week. Um, in the BBC this week, Refugee Week aims to bring communities together. Council calls for volunteers to help refugees. Cathedral given new status for supporting refugees. However, a lot of these stories still don't speak to actual refugees. World Refugee Day is specifically focused on the inclusion of refugees, and yet our media sets a terrible example by failing to include them in the coverage about them. Uh, research from 2021's London College of Communications Refugee Journalism Project shows 64% of news broadcasts about refugees, migrants and asylum seekers do not feature a refugee, migrant or, or asylum seeker voice. You are both journalists. Um, to start, uh, Asama, could you tell us about the importance of hiring refugees as journalists? Yeah, I'm just, I, I, I need to highlight the importance of the Refugee Journalism Project. This incredible initiative, I, I owe this initiative. And um, I say thank you to Vivian and, and all the staff in the Refugee Journalism Project because they helped me a lot. They put me on the right start in this country to just be a freelancer, to write to The Guardian, to write with Middle East Eye, with plenty of, of um, other news outlets here as a refugee journalist. So thank you for the, the Refugee Journalism Project. Great initiative. Training for one year, attending a mini workshop with Bloomberg, The Guardian, BBC, and other um, veteran journalists from here and there. And then um, a fellowship for six months in, in two uh, media news outlets in the country. So a huge experience. And yeah, I, as I said, um, we, we need in this country many initiatives like the Refugee Journalism Project because it's, you know, it's helped you to build your self-confidence as a journalist in this country, to help you to improve your language so you can overcome the language barrier and uh, to introduce you uh, probably to the industry here. So these in initiatives, we need many uh, from uh, this um, initiative. Yeah. And does the language barrier contribute to a lack of refugee voices in UK media? I, I, I think, yeah, it, it's... It, it needs much work from us to just learn language and then learn how to write, how to learn the journalism skills in writing because journalism writing is different from academic or any other writing. So it needs a, uh, a lot of work, but it needs a lot of work to be done from the industry as well. Mm. Just help these people to integrate with you, help these people to um, overcome the, this language barrier because it's, if, if we in in a competition, one student, he's a native, he's um, graduated from any, any university here and a refugee journalism. There is no competition. He will get the job. Mm -hmm. Definitely, he will get the job. So we are talking here uh, in the industry about the diversity, the inclusion. OK, these topics are, are brilliant, but please do this topics on the ground. Hire more refugee journalism and be patient with their language. Train them and develop their skills. And you will get a lot of things because we have an area of experience. No one in this country, even a correspondent, can write about Afghanistan uh, better than Zahra or uh, about Egypt better than me. Even a correspond uh, correspondent live in Egypt or Afghanistan for many years. No, I, I've spent 28 years in Egypt. So I know every single angle of this, uh, of this society. Absolutely. Zahra, I wonder um, what helped you maintain your journalism career when you had to flee to the UK? Uh, the same as Osama said, I want to first thank Vivian, Refugee Journalism Project. Yeah. It, uh, it, it helped me to enter the field of journalism. Uh, it's, it's a good project. I, I really like it and it helped me a lot. Uh, when first I came uh, in the UK, I was in the hotel for six months and spending trauma, stress, anxiety. And just I was thinking... And everyone was teasing me. A journalist is coming from Afghanistan and they were saying, oh, you can go to McDonald's and wash the dishes because you can't do anything with the language barrier, first of all. And I was thinking the same. OK, if I want to live in this country and I, I get like indefinite leave to remain, what job should I do? And I, I was only thinking about washing the dishes or just walking a dog. 
nothing else. But Refugee Journalism Project helped me. I got like uh, uh, nearly one year we had a course with them yeah. and we understand the media in the UK. There is difference in every country. Uh, as uh, Osama mentioned, uh, the coverage is different. Uh, I had like some uh, speech with uh, London College of Communication students and I said, you're an English uh, student. If you want to go for coverage in Afghanistan, you definitely need advice what to do because I know my country, I know my people, I know my culture. It is, it's a shock uh, for a journalist to go for a mission in Afghanistan and for a coverage. When she's uh, going to come back after the coverage, I'm sure she will uh, bring trauma and anxiety with herself. Mm. So it's better to hire uh, refugee journalists. They can work together. We can find understanding with each other. Like as we integrate in the UK, journalists who wants to go for coverage in other countries, they need to first integrate with the culture, with the problems, with the host country, what is there going on, and then they can do their job. Uh, without experience, we can't do anything. Experience is the mother of the knowledge. So some people are coming in this country with experience, like they are uh, mm. doctors, they are engineers, they are journalists. They need to go back to their own fields. It's very difficult for a journalist to throw away her pen, don't write anymore, yeah. mm. just go and think uh, to work in Tesco or wash dishes in somewhere. It's very important to hire them and they have better experience and also they have better understanding with lived experience. I can cover about Afghan women very easy, very easy. And uh, within the community I am, like if I want to um, interview an uh, Afghan woman about uh, why schools are, it's a uh, thousand days that schools are closed in Afghanistan, million of women are ready to come and to be interviewed by me. Yeah. But if an English journalist wants, she's she will find it very difficult yeah. to find even one person for an interview. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. So uh, it's better to support refugee journalists as well. Mm -hmm. You raise such an important point and you know, probably the the key theme of Media Storm because sometimes at Media Storm we get uh, called up by outlets like BBC Today program looking for refugees that that they can interview, and and this would be great except that their line of interviewing often puts refugees off from wanting to speak because they are only asked about their trauma, and we believe that refugees should be invited to to not not share their trauma but their expertise their expertise by experience yeah. um have i mean clearly you know you've seen that that this happens in the media have either of you had experience of of this you mentioned a guardian article yeah i i, I collaborated in 2021 with the european uh, center of journalism uh, we put together a toolkit for refugee journalists how to cover refugee stories and I remember with our uh, with my colleague in the project, we, we put some advice that don't focus on the, the trauma. Just consider the mental health. Mm. Because these people have been through a, a horrible experience. Maybe they, they, they experienced death many times, threats. Maybe they, they had nightmares. And for myself, I myself spent many years with the same nightmare that I've been arrested in the airport, I've been deported to Egypt, I'm in jail. So... A lot of people, and Zahra said she, she spent six months with this trauma. So don't focus too much on this side because considering mental health for mm. these people, it's it's a crucial point for them in the early stage in the, any new country. If every single one meet them, oh, how to flee your country? Uh, just tell me about the horrible experience in, in the Mediterranean. Just for the, for the God's sake, just leave this point. Leave them alone. They, they have problems. They have mental health issues. Respect this. So I, I think it's a fatal mistake for any journalist to go deeply with this point. What happened and what happened? Okay, it's important to know the circumstances that forced him to leave. But the fine details about the, 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 the death threats and all these bad things, I think it's, it's better to just leave it. If the, the, the refugee want to, to tell you this story, okay. He, he just, okay with this, just respect his willing and, and go ahead. But rather than just don't go to, to these issues a lot. And the other thing is, as I said, not the victim side. 
not the 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 emotional side no as as you mentioned the expertise mm. his experience and and this you know this motive him this feel the refugee that he's welcomed the country and they are interested about his story with the positive side not the negative side so i think this these two points are important mm. what about you zara um you know do you how do you feel about uh times where have you had to tell your personal story in, in the media uh yes uh, uh, i i was sharing my personal story in media and uh, the thing that i find that's very um interesting i can say it was like people wanted to make others emotion <laughs> emotional to just uh, as you said yeah. they think about emotional point of uh, being a refugee like they put the headline how a uh, journalist become a refugee it can attract uh, people to see okay what she was doing and how she become a refugee and what she's doing now mm. uh, this is something when uh, some refugees are not happy to share their own story and also sometimes we can put others at risk like i have my family back in afghanistan when i share my story i know it has a big yeah. uh, um it will be a big problem or big risk for them uh, maybe taliban come and arrest my family because uh, it happened with me it happened with me because i was sharing my story and uh, when they had the house searching they find out about the house whose house is this and what's she doing she said that she's british spy <laughs> not a journalist welcome to and the team <laughs> they said that same thing <laughs> it is it's very important when we want to uh share with to our story be careful to think about others life as well mm. um but as i mentioned mostly the medias they think about to make it emotional and uh just to grab people's attention mm. yes yeah. because and the more clicks and the more yeah. likes and the more reactions you get to a news article the more people read it and the more advertising revenue you get and that is unfortunately what drives a lot of the mainstream media this these days yeah i'm um, just want to add something you remember we mentioned the exporting the mm. na- the narrative to authoritarian countries um the the media here the the, the way they are dealing with the refugee the exporting this to egyptian national media owned and controlled by the intelligence and one of the um Egyptian mouthpieces he always called me shamefully refugee the shameful refugee Osama Gawish mm-hmm. okay and I'm 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 taking this opportunity to say I'm proudly a refugee and I respect every single refugee in this country or in the world because they are human being it it is not it is not a shame to be a refugee or asylum seekers you are looking for your safety because this authoritarian leaders made your life in danger and put your life in danger so you will be a stupid man to stay and let them kill you or jail you no we we are here zara mentioned at the beginning we need to be alive and here we go we are alive in the country and yes we are refugee and we are proud and even if we are alone we don't think about only ourselves we think about our family yeah. everyone has a family like myself i have two children i need to look after them they need me so if they don't i i don't want to save my life who look after them Definitely. if i don't want to save them so it is like there's no shame to be a refugee yeah. uh, i know it hurts me it's painful how i left my life behind and i had a good life i was so happy with my life in afghanistan when i see the differences i didn't know how to go to the bus because i didn't get used to go to by bus yep. i had my own car my own uh, house everything and now every time the landlord is coming to ask for the rent this and that these are all problems the refugees they don't want to uh, experience all these problems and i'm trying my best to break down the language barrier to learn to improve my language and to work but as a single mom with two children there is some some points uh, a mother alone can't work like full time to look after two young children yeah. and rebuild her life rebuild um uh, the life she had the same it's it's not easy and also improve the language as uh, osama mentioned just be patient with their language barrier give them chance uh we can support them like 
uh, if I have like a lot of English community to speak with them every day as a job or somewhere as friends, I can improve it soon. We are human. When human want to do something, they can do. Yeah. Everything is possible, but they need time. And and you need to think about, you know, if British people, and I I don't hope this at all, but for example, if British people need to seek asylum or be a refugee in Egypt or in Afghanistan, and they found every single one around them speak a different language, and they couldn't understand a single word, you need this society to be patient. If a journalist from BBC or from The Guardian start his new career in Egypt, he needs to learn Arabic. And he will go and study an Arabic course to just learn what this word means and what this word means. So it, it's the same for us. We need time to integrate with the community. We want to be adding values in this community. So just be patient. Just give us opportunity. Give us more opportunity and respect this language barrier. It, it's it's not something we are we are embarrassing with. No, this is our main language and we want to integrate with an, a different community with a different language and English will be second language. I volunteered with BBC Suffolk Radio in the early uh, days of my uh, asylum seeker here in the country in 2018. And the first lesson, John, the anchor in BBC uh, Suffolk Radio, teaching me that don't think about the British accent. Don't think about the fluency. Just express yourself mm. and understand what we are saying and welcome to the British industry uh, in the media. So this is exactly what the industry need to offer the refugees. Definitely. And we, I mean, you know, I think there's a lot about when I go to different countries and I feel like British people, there is, they don't understand how, how lucky they are that such a huge majority of countries speak English yeah. to some degree, you know, and we can go to any country probably in Europe and get by without having to put in any effort because somebody there will speak English to some degree. Um, and I think, yeah, we should all have a serious think about how how lucky we are and how difficult it is yeah. um, to, to come over. Um, thank you both so much. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. Before we wrap up, is there anything that you came to say that you feel like you didn't get to say? Is there anything else you want to say? Thank you for having us. Uh, yes, I always have my last wishes. <laughs> Or whoever uh, is listening to us, I always ask them, please don't forget countries like Afghanistan, like Iran, like uh, Syria, other countries. They are in war and conflict. I know in Afghanistan, some people might say, you have a government, there's no war. But don't forget them. They need your support. We should be united as human, not thinking about the borders. Borders are only made just to make sure that there's different countries with different languages, but the human are all the same. If tomorrow you think that um, prime minister say for one week schools are banned for girls, do you think it will be acceptable for a United uh, uh, Kingdom? Do you think it will be uh, acceptable for the European Union? Tomorrow the prime minister won't be in his place. It is the same in Afghanistan. Yeah. Why we shouldn't think about Afghan girls? They are not allowed to go to school. Just please be united for those girls and we need to campaign for them. We need to find ways for them to help them. All girls are starving, not for food, for education in Afghanistan. It's the same in Iran and you see it's increasing day by day. It's like a virus, like COVID went from one country to other country. It's increasing, it's going from one country to other country in, in Iran and tomorrow you'll see it will be in, in other countries and I, I'm sure it will affect other countries like United Kingdom as well because everything has a, a um, positive and negative point. Mm. Uh, the negatives always uh, spread everywhere. The positive is the same. So we shouldn't let uh, governments like uh, Taliban and other governments to spread their virus all around the world. Thank you. Yeah, and my, my final message, and it, it is not political at all. Firstly, thank you for having me, but for everyone listen to this conversation, please think about people in Gaza, in Palestine. 
there are now 1.7 million Palestinian people forcibly displaced from their houses and they're stuck in Rafah in a very tiny area. And they are possible refugees. And they can make their way to UK or European countries. And I, I don't hope this happen. I hope this ongoing genocide and war is stopped immediately. So please, in July 4th, vote for any candidate, stand for humanity. Vote for any candidate, calls for immediate ceasefire. Vote for any candidate, whatever the, the political party is, it doesn't matter. Just what does matter is he's supporting refugees, he's supporting human being, he calls for ceasefire. Thank you. Thank you so much. Where can people follow you and do you have anything to plug? Because I'm not only a journalist, I'm a woman rights activist as well. I'm uh, doing a lot of advocacy for refugees uh, in the UK and around the world and for Afghan girls and women, not only Afghan women and girls all around the world. As you said about uh, uh, Palestine, what's happening. So they can, they can just search my name on Google and they can find me. <laughs> Yeah, um, um, they can find me on Twitter, Osama Gawish, and on TikTok as well, Osama Gawish 2, because the one has been deleted. <laughs> and uh, on uh, YouTube, I have a YouTube channel in Arabic and in English as well. Perfect. Thank, Thank you both so much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.